Great. So we have our third short course now, and it will be presented by Dr. Phil Townsend. He's a professor of forest and wildlife ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he's also a visiting distinguished scientist at JPL. His lab focuses on the use of remote sensing for ecosystem function. And there's the UWNSPEC, which is the Environmental Spectroscopy Laboratory, which is part of his research venture and an important measurement facility for his research. Today, he'll be presenting on imaging spectrosco spectroscopy from space, which will be specifically focused on vegetation studies. So please, let's welcome Professor Townsend. Thank you, and I really do want to give credit to uh, quite a number of people who have contributed to this uh, to the slides, especially by postdoc Zhu Wei Wang and grad student Adam Kluse, who, who provided a lot of the information that I'm going to show you. And uh, just acknowledge up front uh, some of the support from both NSF associated with the NEON program and, and NASA, and, and quite a bit of the, the work that I'm going to show you has been done as part of my um, uh, visiting scientist uh, stay uh, here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So I'm picking up uh, in many respects from, from uh, some of the things that Janine talked about in her talk about biodiversity earlier today, and in particular trying to be a bit of an evangelist for, for imaging spectroscopy as a way for us to fill in the gaps uh, on, of information on diversity and function of, of ecosystems uh, that we might not otherwise be able to measure on the ground. So I'm going to talk about what imaging spectroscopy is. Um, apologies to, for those of you for whom this will be a fairly low-level uh, di discussion of that. And then I'm going to talk about fo foliar functional traits and imaging spectroscopy as a basis for characterizing the diversity and function of ecosystems. And then I'll pro provide some results and, and some uh, example applications from this. And uh, uh, as well, uh, throughout this, talk about how we learn something about biodiversity and what the potential is. Now, one of the things that's, that's worth mentioning about imaging spectroscopy from space is that the idea would be to eventually be doing this, but most of the examples that I'll show, with the exception of maybe just one or two, will be from aircraft data because there currently isn't an imaging spectrometer in, in space that, for, that we can use to, to do what I'm talking about. So for those of you who are new to hyperspectral data or imaging spectroscopy, uh, one of the quick things that I need to do is just show you uh, some of the ways in which we represent imaging spectroscopy. So this is a vegetation spectrum from 400 to 2,500 nanometers. This would be a true color image. Oftentimes we show these as these data cubes here where there's all of the spectral information in many, many different wavelengths. And then again, here's our vegetation spectrum with visible near-infrared and a couple short-wave infrared wavelengths. It's actually really hard, I find, to convey how much information is in an imaging spectroscopy image. So this is our visible image again here. This would be something much more like we would see much more frequently, a false color infrared image where we put one of the near-infrared wavelengths that we don't see into the red band, or even a shortwave infrared false color image, which again is moving a little bit away from what we normally would visualize, which, in which we use two infrared wavelengths uh, uh, in there. But there's just all of this information content that we don't really see. So oftentimes what we'll do is something like a, a minimum noise fraction or a principal components analysis where we boil down this information and try to show uh, an imaging spectroscopy image with kind of all the variation that's in there. And a lot of the images that I'll show you will actually be some kind of uh, principal components analysis or minimum noise function uh, fraction just with the idea of being trying to show an image that doesn't look like anything that we would see uh, visually but uh, convey that there's a lot of information content in the data. And these images, by the way, are from Avarice NG flights uh, that were done uh, over India in 2016. Okay, so the whole idea of imaging spectroscopy data is that across the electromagnetic spectrum, we make a lot of narrow measurements compared to something like multispectral data, such as Landsat and MODIS wavelengths, which are shown right here on this graph, where there are broad components of the, of the uh, incoming solar radiation that are measured. So 
broadband or multispectral data, hyperspectral data, and it's this very narrow band information that is, uh, that is, is of use to us. So what I'm going to do now is try to go through uh, my explanation of why we want to use this. And I'm going to give several examples, uh, some from my research, some from other folks' research to, to try to illustrate this. But I, I oftentimes show this figure as, as my basis for, for making the argument that we need these data. So biodiversity research obviously encompasses encompasses all of the taxa, and some taxa are more easy to measure. There's a lot known about the distribution of giraffes uh, um, on Earth, a very you know, endangered species, population has been declining, for which we can do censuses and have, if not complete, nearly complete information. When we think about the vegetation in the ecosystem that these other taxa depend upon, though, it's much more difficult to, uh, to understand how we would completely characterize that. So think about a forest ecosystem here. We can't, we can't measure or map all of the different tree species that we would see in this ecosystem. We can use something like a flux tower, which is shown right here, which can characterize the, uh, the gas exchange between the, uh, the uh, boundary layer and the vegetation. But this information is difficult to get, and it's, it's also perhaps not as charismatic. And I'd like to think that imaging spectroscopy provides that charismatic basis for us to measure all of the things about this vegetation that we're interested in. So we can bring up the Lorax and ask who speaks for the trees, and I would say imaging spectroscopy is something that can speak for the vegetation. So what are plants doing and what's different among, uh, among plants that allows us to use imaging spectroscopy? And again, following up on Janine, there are some very basic characteristics that we've always used in remote sensing. So chlorophyll content, for example, being a very obvious uh, feature that we see because we see it with our eyes and it's present in the visual spectrum. And it's also uh, the basis for, for uh, fluorescence, which we spoke about. But then as Janine brought up, there's differences in the structure of plants. So this is actually a sugar maple leaf here with um, low LMA, low mass per area, versus a pine needle. There's very different light interaction with these. But there's also all of the different components of a leaf that, that drive photosynthesis. So ultimately, we're interested in photosynthesis. Ultimately, we're also interested in a lot of the other ecosystem processes that are associated with productivity and and photosynthesis. So what we're really talking about are processes that occur at the leaf level. And this isn't really necessarily what we would be able to measure from imaging with imaging spectroscopy from space, but these are the things that are important to ecosystems. And I, I break them down into a variety of different categories. Those factors of leaves that we can see or we can use information about because of the bonds in the, the, the molecules within the leaves and the structure of the leaf to be able to get at photosynthesis, so something like nitrogen concentration, which is a key indicator um, as, as Janine uh, was, was discussing with the uh, leaf economic spectrum and Peter Reich's work, leaf mass per area, but also sugars and starches, so the allocation of the products of photosynthesis to uh, different uh, fast and slow pools, chlorophyll, pigments, water concentration, and then a variety of other uh, n nutrients that are important for, for metabolism. But also, at the leaf level, there are characteristics such as structural compounds, lignin, cellulose, that are important to decomposition. So perhaps not necessarily so important to the photosynthetic part, but once the, once the leaves come off the tree, they're really important, or the vegetation, they're really important to the recycling of vegetation recalcitrants of the vegetation. And then there are the compounds that plants um, uh, put their energy into that might be related to defense or, or, or other symbiotic relationships with their environment, such as tannins and, and phenolics. The point of all of this is that if you could imagine, each different color of these lines maybe refers to a different category here, photosynthesis, decomposition, defense. There might also be stress responses and so forth. There are a lot of narrowband features. So for example, a narrowband feature right here associated with phenolics um, that, that, are, that are embedded in the spectrum of a leaf, as shown here, that we can, we, ha we can and have used for a long time at the leaf level to be able to identify these different components. Uh, there are 60,000 different wood, woody species 
uh, out there. We can't actually map all of those, but we can map how they're different and maybe using some of this other information that Janine uh, brought up, use it to determine what we've got there and how it's functioning. So there are these narrow band features, you know, for example, chlorophyll that you would see in these visible wavelengths that we, can, that we see at the leaf level that we can use as a basis of, for spectroscopy to measure the, the, uh, the characteristics of an ecosystem that we're interested in. So if you think about imaging spectroscopy, I'm not going to talk about the details of, of the instruments because there are people in this room who have far more expertise on that. But basically, instead of a measurement of, of an individual leaf, every pixel is a spectrum, as shown here from this uh, neon image from Ordway Swisher Reserve in, in Florida. So we get a lot of information here, and the idea is to use this information much like we would use this information here to be able to map some of these traits. And the idea then is we can then understand ecosystems. We can understand the variability within an ecosystem and the function uh, of, of the ecosystem as a basis for uh, measuring functional variability and, and perhaps other, other components of variability. So what are the different things that we want to use imaging spectroscopy for? The most obvious one, and the one for which there have been quite a lot of papers, is actually just mapping species composition. And this is the sort of thing that can work on a very, uh, on a very narrow scale, at an individual location. As I said, there are many, many thousands of species that could potentially dominate the canopy, not just a forest canopy. But at, on a limited scale, and this is, um, this is from the Appalachian Mountains, uh, Central Appalachian Mountains in Maryland and uh, Pennsylvania and West Virginia, you could actually map species composition. And so this is just an example from some work of mine maybe 10 or 12 years ago where we were able to really accurately determine all of these different, different communities uh, within this ecosystem. But it was just a limited area. And if we had applied that map to say California, it might have made a map of something. It, these would have been what we would have fed the map, but this would not be correct because these species don't grow in California. So, but that's, that's a starting point, that on a limited basis, imaging spectroscopy can provide that. So species. And then there's the genetic component of it, and I'm not even going to, to uh, do justice. Uh, I'm, I'm boiling it down to one-third of a slide, Janine, <laughs> as opposed to your talk. But, but basically, there's the signal of genetic variation in plants. And actually, I added this later, there's both the micro and macro genetic aspect of it. This is from uh, work with Mike Madrich. This is Aspen Forest in Utah, uh, right here. And, and what we found is that we were able to detect differences in genotypes of aspen uh, growing uh, in, in a fairly small area. And aspen's a clonal species, so you have large patches of it. And what, what's important about what we found is that imaging spectroscopy could better discriminate differences between genotypes of aspen than soil information and foliar information. Well, why is that? Well, the imaging spectroscopy, if you believe what I'm saying about traits, the imaging spectroscopy is collecting a full record of, of the chemistry and structure of the canopy, including things that we didn't measure, whereas our soil measurements and our leaf measurements were just the chemistries that we could afford to do or that we knew to do. So, so there's a lot of information that we can actually use that's in the imaging spectroscopy to look at uh, the, uh, some of the drivers of variation. In this case, it would be related to selection. At the same time, there's work that Janine uh, and Dudu Morales, who's in the room here, have done where, where we actually see the longer term or the, the macro evolutionary aspects, the conservation of characteristics at different wavelengths. And these are actually different wavelengths and different groups uh, within the phylogeny and seeing where we, we see conservation of, of, characteristics, of, of, um, of traits. And in this case, the traits might be spectral traits. So there's a lot of information actually buried in there where these aren't species differences, but they're actually genetic differences uh, in, in, um, in uh, Aspen, in this case, that we can actually uh, use the imaging spectroscopy to, to identify. And then finally, uh, Janine also brought up uh, phenotype. This is actually, this is the one satellite imaging spectroscopy uh, result that I have in here. This is from Hyperion from Iceland. Uh, where we have very low diversity in the vegetation here, 
but this is actually a map of nitrogen concentration. We have high variation in nitrogen concentration. In this particular lake, Lake Mivatan, generates a lot of midges. These midges come off the lake and deposit on the land. They're a nutrient source that fertilizes the landscape, and so you have higher nitrogen uh, areas around the lake and progressively less uh, nitrogen um, uh, uh, as you move with distance from the lake. A, the, a lot of the same species, this is a very species poor system, maybe eight or 10 species that occur in this landscape. They're genetically connected, but phenotypically uh, they experience different environments. So this is, these are the areas that we can use imaging spectroscopy to, to characterize. This is not new by any stretch of the imagination. The first paper on using imaging spectroscopy was, came out of the University of Wisconsin, so we're very proud of this, although everybody moved on, from Carol Westman and John, John Aber at Blackhawk Island, which is a, a very well understood island with diverse geology. Uh, it's a small island in the Wisconsin River, but it has quite a number of different vegetation communities associated with different soils. The first uh, version of uh, imaging spectrometer from uh, JPL AIS was flown there in the mid-1980s, and uh, uh, Carroll's paper in Nature uh, map foliar concentrations, in this case it's showing lignin, um, as a basis to actually estimate nitrogen mineralization. So this is where that li lignin concentration is associated with recalcitrance, which would lead to nitrogen mineralization and recycling of nitrogen within the ecosystems. So this is going back 30 years uh, when, when people first started doing this. This work continued on uh, through, through the 90s with additional work showing nitrogen concentration, being able to be mapped uh, from Avarice and different ecosystems. I think this is from the Oregon transect. Uh, Martin and Aber continuing to do this work at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, this is Black Hawk Island and I believe Harvard Forest maybe. But he, I should actually say this work actually goes back even further. I mean, we knew, we've known with our eyes that there are these spectral differences in plants going back a long way. So there's actually been a lot of studies over you can look in every decade since the 19 teens and find scientific papers about reflectance of plants and, and what, what is in them. And this actually led to the, the development of methods in the 1970s uh, to use spectrometry as a basis for, for measuring the quality of vegetation, largely in agronomic uh, sciences. And this is actually a basis for a whole area of science that most of us don't even interact with but ha has, long, has long been used. So it's got a, there's a long history of using these type of data for, for looking at the quality of vegetation. So continuing my uh, history lesson just a little bit further, uh, imaging spectroscopy has been used in a number of different applications and I think this is why uh, a lot of us have been so excited by it over the years. Uh, so especially coming out of the group, uh, Scott Ollinger, John Aber, uh, M.L. Smith, Mary Martin at the University of New Hampshire about using these estimates of foliar characteristics to seed models to, to actually simulate uh, changes in NPP, changes in vegetation characteristics, changes in nutrient uh, holding in watersheds and so forth um, using what we get out of imaging spectroscopy as the basis for this. Asner and Vitusek, uh, another interesting paper looking at invasive species in Hawaii that change the nutrient dynamics. These invasive species have higher nitrogen content and change nitrogen con uh, dynamics in, in these Hawaiian uh, ecosystems. And it just can extend further and further to using multiple different types of traits as so carbon, nitrogen, and water content. This is work from Kyla Dahlin at uh, Jasper Ridge to actually better understand and map the, t the types of vegetation and what makes these vegetation types different. Not species anymore, but using the traits to identify the difference. Functionally different ecosystems rather than species different ecosystems. So Janine showed this slide here uh, previously. This is another very similar slide, but this is the basic concept, is that, we, that if imaging spectroscopy enables us to measure these things that we're interested in but are hard to measure on the ground, it provides a basis to fill in the gap. So on both of these figures, you're seeing latitude 
on the uh, x-axis, and you're seeing some sort of measure on the y-axis. So on the y-axis of this one, this is the species uh, map. This is the number of species that occur um, by, uh, by uh, latitudinal zone, and then these are uh, the number of species for which there was trait data when they wrote this paper. And you see there's a huge gap between how many species there might be and the species for which we have uh, trait data. And uh, I would argue that the main components of the uh, leaf economic spectrum that Janine showed you, we can actually get at using imaging spectroscopy or through models applied to imaging spectroscopy. Similarly, if we look at flux data, this is actually where the GPP occurs on the planet at different uh, latitudes. And these are where we have flux towers. Obviously, we have a lot of flux towers in the mid-latitude uh, of the north northern hemisphere. And this is uh, quite separated from actually where a lot of the fluxes occur on the globe. And so there's, there's this need to fill this gap. If we can measure with imaging spectroscopy those traits that are related to photosynthesis or GPP, then we might be able to fill in these gaps by using the imaging spectroscopy in places where it's difficult to set up and maintain flux towers. So, can we do it globally? Almost all of the studies that I've showed you up, up to now are site-based studies. And I think that's the big thing that's happened over the last 10 years. Mary Martin had a paper about 10 years ago with nitrogen content where they used Hyperion and Avarice data from a lot of different locations, different forest types across the globe, and showed that they can build a single empirical model that would predict those traits. Uh, my former graduate student then extended that to quite a number of different traits. This is LMA, nitrogen, carbon, uh, fiber, lignin, cellulose, and then a few others as well. And uh, these maps, by the way, are maps of the trait and then the uncertainty in the trait. So we can map the, the trait and its uncertainty, which is a requirement uh, for, for most spaceborne missions, that you know the uncertainty on a pixel-wise basis. So, um, so I think it becomes reasonable then uh, to, to riff off of this Asner et al. paper, quanti quantifying forest canopy traits, imaging spectroscopy versus field survey, that this, this becomes a basis for us to characterize ecosystems without having to sample them intensively everywhere. At this point, the methods that we have do require us to have samples for validation and for, uh, for, for um, model training. But the idea is that you can actually use the imaging spectroscopy to get into plots virtually through the data and estimate the traits. And as Greg showed in this paper, you have very high uh, accuracy and confidence in, in the results of what you get. And, and, and Greg, by far and away, is the person who's used this most effectively with his imaging over Peru, where he then grouped his different functional classes based on the different traits that, that he had measured shown right here. Um, this isn't all imaging spectroscopy. He uses a little bit of extrapolation using other data sources. But he was basically able to identify these functional types throughout Peru. And then they used some simple GIS analyses in Peru to identify places where functional uh, combinations occurred, but there wasn't uh, any protected part of the landscape. And that became a basis for, for establishing new reserves in Peru. Uh, based on their functional variation. So this is a really effective use, and I think it's, it's the sort of thing that, from a practical standpoint, we'll, we'll be able to use. And I, I don't want to give short shrift to the GPP part of it. This, we're talking more about diversity here. I'm, I'm very interested in, in productivity and, and uh, the carbon cycle and nutrient cycling. This is work that came out of uh, my group. Sean Bois was a grad student with, uh, and then also with Ankur Desai. Linking uh, the, the concept here is that with the imaging spectroscopy, we're measuring the traits like LMA and nitrogen that are related to GPP. Uh, can we better predict GPP as measured by flux towers using the imaging spectroscopy data than we might using the current data, the current methods that are used with, say, MODIS? So this is the SIMS MODIS model, but applied to Avarice uh, classic imagery. Um, and what we see is that among these different ecosystem types in California, we fall on a line with very little bias. We're able to actually measure GPP. Uh, this would be instant, instantaneous GPP within an hour of when the image was actually collected. And in contrast to uh, the typical approaches that are currently used, you see that there's quite a bit of bias off the one-to-one -one line, and it, and, it, and it performs pretty well. <laughs> 
So we have a strong foundation of science for doing imaging spectroscopy from space. And I think that you know we often, in remote sensing, talk about spatial, temporal, spectral resolution. But we're actually getting some functional resolution, I think, from this data at this point that allows us to address ur urgent questions about the biosphere um, and to characterize all sorts of different uh, types of diversity. So I'm going to show a couple of slides right now about workflows, and then I'm going to show some results about how we have applied uh, what I'm talking about to, to data from, from NEON. And there's, there's actually a, a quite huge barrier to entry, I think, for imaging spectroscopy um, in that a lot has to actually happen between the images, when the images are collected, and when one gets the trait maps. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to pitch something for myself here, the work that I did at JPL this past year, but I and a number of other people are really working hard. David Thompson is another example of this, to actually put together open source code and put it on, uh, on GitHub to enable people to take reflectance data or the data that we would actually get from these airborne instruments and work it through a whole processing flow that's needed before you can get to the trait maps. A lot of the users out there just want the trait maps. They're not actually interested in, in doing all of the image processing parts. So we might have developed models with data from lots of different places over the US. We've got these models and they get applied to the data. Other people, Greg Asner or whomever, might have also developed different models. But what we need to do is be able to have this. And a lot of this stuff is coming and is, and is coming uh, really, really soon. And just as an example of this, this is work um, that, that I'm currently doing with uh, Fabian Sch Schneider and Ryan Pavlik and some other people at JPL is we're taking these models that we've developed and we've been applying them to the California Hispiri data that uh, was uh, collected uh, pre-Hispiri data, so collected in support of Hispiri. Uh, Avarice was flown multiple times for several years and then once per year uh, every year thereafter, so about 10 or 12 different um, time periods of flights over these whole areas of California. And we're now actually getting to the point where we can apply these trait models across all of these locations at all of these different times. And here, this is just an example over an area of the Sierras. It's showing um, three different traits, and I can't read it from there, but I can look at it here. It's cellulose, LMA, and nitrogen uh, across elevational transects. And I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but this actually makes sense based on the vegetation types that are here, what the values are of these different traits. Um, but we're actually probably getting to the point where we can do this, and if we can integrate it with LIDAR and fluorescence and other types of data, we can get complete characterization of, of ECOSYS. There's also a lot of places online now where people can put their data, and uh, especially within, within GitHub. Okay. So let's just talk about NEON. So NEON is probably our best uh, data that we have out there for looking at multiple different types of ecosystems. So NEON is this network of sites that are covering all the biomes of the US. They have an, air, uh, an airborne imaging spectrometer that's very similar to Avaris NG. Actually, it's the same as Avaris NG. And they fly over sites within each one of these domains annually or near annually. And we have a project where we're trying to apply uh, develop and apply trait models to that would work across all these domains. And this is a basis for eventually scaling up. So we've collected field data from all of these domains. We've got over 1,240 field plots that are the basis of, of the results. So if we think about what NEON is, eventually it's going to be how we uh, validate data from a spaceborne imaging spectrometer when one gets launched, whether it's HISUI or SBG or something like that. We have an image processing workflow. And what we've been able to do, which is really exciting, is develop trait models. This is LMA, leaf mass per area, that actually work across all of the different domains. So these are four forested domains here, UNDERC in Wisconsin, Jones Research Center in Georgia, CERC in Virginia, and Talladega National Forest in Alabama, and then Kanza Prairie in Kansas, where we've got one model that we use to map LMA, which is shown in the second of each one of these different pairs of, of figures. So if we, if we look at our data, we can actually start to look at what foliar traits look like, what the variability of foliar traits within domains are. 
By the way, these are all of the traits that we're doing. There are actually 22 of them. The key is to actually look at this value, which is the, um, the uncertainty value. Almost all of these traits that we have have uncertainty values less than 15%, which is really, really quite good. This is Talladega that you're seeing here, and that's an MNF image. So one can look at the different traits now. Uh, we can just visualize them. So this is LMA, chlorophyll, and nitrogen, the three traits that would be most closely related with, with photosynthesis. Um, so the higher LMA, these would be the conifers that you would see right here. Or we could look at some of the other traits that we have. So in this case, it's LMA, potassium, and phenolics, again, shown in red, green, and blue uh, colors here. So the red areas are these conifers that I mentioned to you that have high LMA. Interestingly enough, the higher uh, potassium broadleaf species that you see are right here. And then species with higher phenolics, defensive compounds that you see here, a lot of the conifers also show up in that area. Okay, I'm running out of time, but I'm gonna go ahead and just show you how we can visualize some of this. So how do we visualize this trait space? And I'm not going to show you any of the, um, of the functional trait diversity metrics, because at this point that's probably too much. I'm just gonna show you um, principal components analysis of the trait data. So we have 22 traits, we have field data, and we have image data where those traits have been mapped. This is from Kanza right here. So this is actually a principal components analysis of the image, the blue, the blue triangles are the image traits. So we've got about 53% of the variation explained on two principal components analyses. And this is actually where the field data that we have from the Kanza area, area fall out in that trait space. And we can actually look at how this relates to uh, variation in different types of traits right here. So uh, if we look at the broadleaf tree species in the green, which are over in this area, towards higher nitrogen content, for example, um, than some of the other species in some of the agriculture or agricultural plots that we measured in that, in that domain. But that's just one domain. We can actually look at how all of the different domains fall out. And um, my point here is that across these thousand plots, so these are the plots that we measured, this is what the imagery shows, we can see that there's actually quite a bit of trait space that's not captured in the plot data. And I would hypothesize that these are good places to go and look and see what's there. These are, this is the information content that we're trying to get from imaging spectroscopy. I don't know exactly what this is, but this is the information that, that we want to know and what imaging spectroscopy will provide to us. And we can. Can you just clarify, so the PCA is done on um, the different uh, spectral domains? The PCA is done on the uh, traits as mapped from the spectral bands. And how many traits do you have? 22. And then the PCA, so it's, you know, two different, it's uh, uh, all the data are together. So this is the, the field data have the same measurements. So this is where the field data would fall out as well. So I'm not going to show it, but we can actually compare PCAs of traits versus PCAs of, of the spectral data as well. And we see that there's a, the information content from the traits that we derive from, from the data is different from the information content we derive just from the spectral data. We can actually look at key species. I've just picked out some of the common species. These are all broadleaf hardwoods, and you can see they all kind of fall in one area towards higher nitrogen and higher phosphorus. And again, there's other, other species that are not shown there, but we can actually look and see how, how species uh, um, fill out the trait space. And this is actually, this is still looking at the trait space, again, looking across all of these domains where we've collected data. The triangles here are from the imagery is sort of the uh, density location of trait space for a location. So this one here is domain three, which is, Liz can help me with that. I believe that is uh, the Florida um, domain. And you can actually see that actually our field data and our image data are actually fairly close to each other in this trait space that we've got shown by these two principal components. But some of them are further apart. So for example, if we look at domain seven right here from the, um, uh, from the uh, Appalachians, um, we'll see that our field data and our our, our image-based trait spaces are actually a little bit different from each other. So this, be, this starts to become a basis for us to figure out what we've measured in terms of trait diversity um, uh, across, across broad landscapes. So I am out of time. Um, we can, 
Uh, I've just got uh, this one last slide here from, from Fabian Schneider. Again, we start to integrate a lot of different data from LIDAR, from imaging spectroscopy, and we can actually really start to understand the drivers of, of what these patterns look like. This is from Fabian's uh, dissertation research in, in, uh, in Switzerland, so it has nothing to do with anything I've shown, but it's still a really nice looking <laughs> graphic. <laughs> actually has a lot to do with what I've shown, but just better. <laughs> so. In any event, um, I'm a really big believer in imaging spectroscopy, obviously. We really actually need these time series now. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why NEON is going to be really great, but why we need a spaceborne sensor, because we need to look at not just annual changes, that changes that might be associated with hu human land use and climate change, but also changes that are seasonally uh, different. So in, in some ecosystems, such as grassland ecosystems, you have changes of tr in traits uh, as different species blink in and out of the ecosystem that are going to be important to characterize. And I just want to kind of pitch Black Hawk Island because it's the first location where a lot of this work was done. It's been measured every few years by an imaging spectrometer. And including this year, we've been trying to, we've tried to image this seasonally over the course of this year, but it's eventually going to be a great testing ground for looking at almost 30 years of, of imaging spectroscopy data. Okay, thank you. <laughs>